Hey, coaches, welcome to another Football Scoop online clinic today. Uh, really excited to have St. Thomas head coach Glenn Caruso join us. Uh, he's going to talk about building and sustaining a championship culture. And, uh, you know, I'm really excited to hear what Car Coach Caruso has to say. I want to give you the floor. Uh, coach Caruso, take it away, man. I appreciate it. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't start with just saying how grateful we are for so many things. I think this time allows everyone to reflect and think a little bit about <clears throat> what we have. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to take the chance just to say thank you. The scoop is something that it, it is a it is a necessary tool for a lot of coaches, and it's a place you can go and learn a lot, connect a lot, as we're doing today, share a lot. So grateful for the scoop, grateful for everybody's time. I know that's very valuable. We're going to do our best not to make this. You know, I don't have an hour's worth of stuff to talk to you about that's any good. So but we'll keep it 2025, and then uh, see where it goes from there. Just short enough so you'll watch it, but long enough so it doesn't become a sound bite. So only football coaches will probably watch it. And one of the things that I reflect on just over the last <clears throat> two weeks is how grateful I am for the sport of football. And I think we all say that, but times like this, I mean, if this doesn't remind you of why we get a chance to coach the greatest sport ever created in the world, uh, then you're not looking hard enough because all of those things that football and the people have poured into us are probably a lot of what we're drawing from. I know I will get texts hourly from our current players, our future players, and our alums just saying how football has helped uh, mold them. So I think it's probably appropriate to be, be thankful for that as well. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about, uh, like Doug said, not just creating the culture. That's part of it. Building a culture is certainly a steep hill, but then sustaining it. And, and even how do you grow it when you're on in a certain situation or you're on top, a lot of people want to try and plateau and, and how do you stay active? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. A lot of what <clears throat> we talk about involves our two families, our football family, as well as our home family. And so do our, our conversations. And I think like most, like most things, if you want to be honest with yourself, um, you know, we're going to be in a situation where we are compiled up of the people in our lives and the experiences, right, <clears throat> and, uh, and what we do with those. So a lot of my talks actually go back to my father. My father was the greatest man I ever met, coached me, um, you know, Pop Warner and stuff, but well, he was an attorney and um, really coached me every day. Never missed an opportunity to utilize a situation to teach, and that's, that's what I consider to be a great coach uh, in so many ways. Uh, the, the stories, this is a whole different talk, but the stories can go on and on and how he taught them. They were definitely unconventional, but just a tremendous man and um, passed away 15 years ago last week. But he was the type of guy that, you know, when my mom passed away on Christmas Day when I was eight years old, his first family decision was to move his, his law practice into the house and raise his family and do his work and do those together and combine those together. And probably what we do today is, is more a function and a reflection of him than anybody else, me included. Uh, he used to say, when someone gives you a compliment, uh, he said, that's kind of for me. He said, I'll judge you on how your kids turn out, sort of tongue in cheek. But uh, you'll, you'll hear a lot about him. I think the opportunity to use the life lessons that I learned and apply them through football and vice versa is probably what makes us as, uh, as functional as we are as a program. And then the experiences. I mean, this was this is a good laughable clip of me uh, Christmas Day in 1979, it must have been, in my underoos. And Doug, I can still remember I was livid because my brother got the Batman one, and I, I was, like, pissed that I was the Robin, even though I was four years old. And I was a third kid, but you can tell if there are any third kids that are out there, you got my older brother and older sister stocking. And then by the time that it gets to the third kid, you end up just getting the stuff put on the floor. But that's that's me with my first football helmet on Christmas Day. And that's one of my first memories that I've had. And the reason why that's important relative to who our program is, is because my first memory was basically a time where I was four years old and the doctors were telling me that I had leukemia and I wasn't able to be five. But that was my first memory. So every scenario that's occurred after that has been a little bit more positive so far than that one. It's allowed me a frame of reference and a point of view um, that whatever happens to us, we're very fortunate to have the day. We're very fortunate to have the opportunity because it can get taken from you. And the fact that my dad 
would not simply ex accept that fact and took me uh, to Yale New Haven Children's Hospital and obviously over uh, many, many years and a battery of tests and, and situations, we got that correct. So again, I think things go back to the people in your life and how you apply those to the situations that occur and your perspective on it. Now, when I give a talk like this, I always start with, uh, here, this is the caveat, right? I, I wanna make sure that uh, I'm not saying the way that we do things is the best way to do them. I know they work tremendously well for us and we believe in them wholeheartedly. But I think there's a couple of key principles that I don't even wanna start this conversation until we go into. Number one, all of these things assume that you know what your needs are and who your wants are. And I can't go into each one, that's a, that's a separate conversation too. But not being able to delineate between what your needs and what your wants are or confusing your wants for your needs is meant to weakness. It's inefficient and it's not something that, that we would tolerate in the Crusoe family and the University of St. Thomas football family. But knowing what the needs are and the, the more mentally tough we are, the more we realize and maybe a time like this when COVID-19 has us all thinking about a lot of different things, maybe we can realize that the lesser of the needs that we have really means that we are becoming a little bit stronger. Number two, you got to know who you are uh, and you got to know who you're not. And, uh, you know, I, I listened on the, the podcast yesterday and, and coach was talking about, um, coach was talking about how when he was younger, he tried to be like other coaches, emulate those coaches until he had a very influential coach that said, Hey man, you got to be you. And you got to be you at the highest level. But that involves not just knowing who you are, but also knowing who you're not and not pretending about any of that. Don't, don't be uh, so crazy about yourself that you can't be humble with, with what you're not. That's very important, too. And the last thing is, you know, what you want. And I, I, I think a lot of coaches would say, well, obviously, I want. It's not obvious. I mean, in the whole grand scheme of things, it all comes down to you know, the, the beliefs that you have and the people and the output, but you, you've got to know what you want because there are a lot of coaches, the paradox of choice in our profession is that people on the outside are going to tell you what, you know, you should go on to do this, you should want to do this, you should want to do this. And at the end of the day, you've got to come to a realization of what it is that brings you joy. And the, the downfall of that is if we don't know what the end game is, what brings you true joy in your life, whatever that is, then all we're going to be doing is chasing. And in a, in a profession and in a, in a country where we're chasing a lot of things that other people say, I think it's really important for us to know what we're looking for, what's going to bring us joy in the long term. So without going into each, I'll give you an example just of, of the person because the coaches that are watching this are obviously guys that are uh, diligently uh, caring about their craft and growing or else you wouldn't be listening to strange little coach in, in Minnesota uh, talking about how his program survives. I think most people believe they know who they are and who they're not, but until you put pen to paper or fingers to typewriter, I don't think just like goals, they really become in the forefront of your mind. So here's mine, everybody uh, in, our, in our family, uh, every one of our, our players, um, when done right, we have a, a what we're not list and a what we are list. And if we're honest with ourselves, our not list is probably a heck of a lot longer than what we actually are. I know for a fact, I know I'm not brilliant. I know I'm not sophisticated. I know I was never a good athlete. I'm not good looking. I don't deal well with someone that doesn't understand my non-negotiables. I'm just not going to do it. not going to waste whatever time I have on that. I'm not a buddy or pal. I'm not patient. I'm not healthy. I'm not necessarily relaxed. I'm getting healthy. Um, you know, that line is, that's, that's Rachel's line. That's, Rachel is my wife. And and that line she gets to draw and she says, look, man, I understand that the things above the line, you're not, you're never going to be fine. But the things below the line, you're not, and you need to work hard to make those what you are. So I'm working on those on a daily basis. What I am, I, I understand who I am. And um, I understand persistence and the opportunity to carry out a plan. That's, I, I can paint a picture pretty well. I understand I have a, the ability to hold myself. Um, and those I truly love to standards, like ridiculously high standards, standards that most people will say um, are irrational. And I will say, like my father said, you're welcome for them. But I, I, I do that pretty well. Um, I'm not a fast learner, Doug. Um, read my first book, to be, to be honest with you, I read my first book when I was a junior in high school. Uh, I grew up uh, not having 
uh, two parents in the house that would necessarily read to me. And, and my first book was, was when I was 17 years old. So I'm not a fast learner. Um, but once I know the parameters, I will absolutely navigate them quicker than anybody else that, uh, that I know. Got an eye for personal placement. I'm a motivator and I'm a, I'm a pretty decent congregator. I can get a lot of people on a page in pretty quick fashion. So understanding what we are and what our strengths are and not dismissing the things that we're not, but the biggest ROI that we're obviously going to get is to be ourselves. And I think understanding that. Um, the three cultural tenants that we have, and I'll, I'll put these all out there first and talk about them. Uh, this was actually a slide that um, 13 years ago when we interviewed here at the University of St. Thomas, and it was a job that I thought could be pretty awesome. Um, two and eight at the time, but uh, I thought it had some unbelievable pieces to be able to uh, well, do what we're doing. And I put this slide up. It had a different background on it and a different logo at the bottom, but uh, this has not changed at all in 13 years. Our basic cultural tenants are to have pride in our personnel, passion in our performance, and persistence in our plan. Now, the reason why these things are really important to us is not because they're cute and they have they begin with P and I'm playing on some sort of alliteration. Those three words that are underlined are in no way genetic. You are not predisposed to come out of the womb and understand any one of those three things. They're all engineered into you or not. They're all learned behaviors, pride and passion and persistence. So applying that to our beliefs, the people we choose to love, and the output, those core three principles, is really all we do on a daily basis, to be frank with you. For us, um, I'm not going to go too in-depth with these, but we always start with the personnel. So for us, the personnel, whether we're talking about personnel on a Tuesday staff meeting, whether we're talking about recruiting the personnel, uh, whether we're talking about, frankly, um, for me, it was uh, the person that I'm going to marry or how we're going to raise our kids. All the same. All of it's done all the same. These are the basic characteristics that when I look for someone that I want to have in our culture or be attracted to or attached to to hopefully help me grow, these are the characteristics that I look for. Now, they come in different ways. Uh, with your kids, you got boys and girls. And you know, with your players, you got kids that are all different nationalities, and some are skinny, some are hefty, some are tall, some are short, some are different religious affiliations, socioeconomic. All those are wildly different. But the core principle of what runs through who they are, this is in general the type of guy who we have in our program and will continue to have in our program till the day that I pass away. They're guys who enjoy the journey. They embrace the struggle. And I think, like my dad said, hey, Glenn, any jackal can handle the good times. That's easy. I'm going to judge you on how you handle the tough ones. It's so simple as we're realizing now, specifically in this country right now with what we're going through, that uh, maybe things were a lot easier before, and anyone can handle those times. We're going to be judged on, on embracing the struggle. And not just embracing it. This is something that I, I think about quite a bit. It's almost like welcoming the struggle. Like, yes, you have to acknowledge struggles are going to happen. And sometimes struggles might be... Uh, dropping the post route or missing the sack or the girlfriend breaking up with you or failing a test or an illness in the family. But however you apply them, we always know they're coming. So to know that they're coming is one thing, to expect it, to embrace it is another. And we've gotten to the point in our program where our kids welcome it. I mean, we understand we're not going to grow without being uncomfortable. And that's part of it. Number two, they're critical, they're confident, they're optimistic. They're not uh, rose-colored glasses, guys, where everything is perfect. Um, but in general, we, we want to make sure that we're optimistic and looking for ways to say yes before looking for ways to say no, looking for solutions to problems. And that doesn't mean that's not diametrically opposed to being critical. Those two can go together if done honestly. We're forward thinking, uh, what's the next thing that we have to do? Um, I tell our guys quite often, let's say we're at practice on a Wednesday or something, and we're in a little huddle after practice, and I might say to him, hey, uh, we have no idea. Our time is finite. So uh, if, I, if I drive home today, I got a little 20-year-old uh, pickup truck with 320,000 miles and rusted out wheel wells. I love it. Absolutely love it. If I'm driving my little black truck home and a garbage truck sideswipes me and I'm dead, what do I expect you to do tomorrow? Our players will tell you, you come to practice. What do I expect you to do Friday? 
go to the walkthrough and my funeral. That's when I'm going to be buried is on a Friday if I end up dying in the season. They know that. And then on Saturday, you go out and you win and you play well. So there is nothing or, or no one that is above the program, including me and everybody else. So what is the next thing that I need to do to take a positive step forward? They take things personally. They're competitive, like ridiculously competitive. We will overlook a lot of measurables, a lot of measurables, if a kid is uber competitive in every facet of his life. They're stubborn. It's actually an endearing quality for us. Uh, they're highly demanding, and they understand they understand the difference between easy and worthy. And that kind of goes back up to to the top and the struggle is I just know that anything that's been handed to us that that was easy has never been worth a darn. And there is a huge difference between taking the easy path and taking a worthy path. And usually the worthy one is going to be a heck of a lot tougher and it's going to be a heck of a lot more, well, worthy. Um, I don't like the word easy. We don't, there's some words we just don't use in our program. We have a couple four letter words in the Caruso household. You could probably imagine what they are, but in addition to the F word and some of the others, uh, it's easy, luck, Sure, yeah, fine. Things that show indifference or oversimplification and and uh, and that's kind of what I'm they're very highly demanding, not just of themselves, but of their teammates and of myself as well. And then there's the performance. So when it comes down to the performance, these are the the common themes that we work on on a daily basis. Have a consistent structure and defined parameters. Do I want to be intuitive? Yes, we are very intuitive. Do I want to be pliable and adjustable? Yep, and we are. We win more games in the second half than the first. But we can't adjust unless we have a plan from, with, from what to adjust from. Like I said that, right? But I think you know what I'm saying. We have to have some sort of parameters or system or else you're just out there throwing stuff at the wall and hoping it sticks. So the way that we can actually provide some of the most freedom to our kids is expressly by giving them parameters. Any coach that's watching right now that has children knows exactly what I'm talking about. Because if you want to show that true love to them, you will define some sort of parameters and then allow them to go be themselves. We work daily on the ability to recalculate. This is certainly, I've talked about this one thing probably about as much as any over the years. In the last probably eight to 10 years, um, just the fact that so much of the world now is easy, is fast, is available, and is over-digested. I think everybody recognizes those first three, you know, the instant societies. That, that, that's problematic as is. Well, we're really over-digesting what we're giving to our kids. Um, you know, there was a time before play dates, believe it or not, for you young coaches that are 30 years and younger, before play dates where you just had to get on your bike and ride over to Jimmy's house and ring the doorbell and ask if you wanted to play. And maybe Jimmy's mom was like, no, we're having dinner, leave. And she closed the door in your face. The opportunity for failure now has become so much less because we have over-digested a lot of the things that our, our kids do. And recalculating is one of them. Um, the example I like to give, I, I am the worst person in the world at directions. I'm the worst. I can get lost anywhere. I live two miles south of our stadium, our campus. And once in a while, if I'm not paying attention, I'll get lost. And I've made that drive probably 6,000 times. Um, so I can get lost anywhere. So when I'm out and I'm recruiting, I, you know, we got, uh, you know, our phones, they got them in them, but we used to have the Tom Toms on the dashboard. And, and inevitably, I'm in an area where I'm a little uncomfortable with. And the little lady that, that talks to me on the Tom Tom says, in a quarter mile, take a right on Smith Street. But I'm a little nervous. I don't know what's going on. And I take a right on Pine Street. Uh, she doesn't say, you took the wrong turn. I'm now going to shut down. She automatically recalculates. Right? That's what she does. But those are things that we have to provide those opportunities for our guys to have moments of failure within our culture and our practice system so that they can learn. Because I can tell you, but unless you learn it, it's really not going to make much of a difference to you. They have absurdly high expectations. And again, like my dad would say, they're welcome. Um, 
we work on being a good leader and a good follower. And this is something that I've, I've realized along my career path often gets lost in, in translation. Early on, I thought it was you lead, it's very linear. You, you follow, you follow, you follow, and then a point comes where you lead. And in reality, it's just as fluid and intuitive as any other part of life. There are times where in the same day, in the same practice, in the same play, you have to be a leader, a good leader, and a good follower, and ebb and flow in and out of those different roles. And being able to flip that switch and do it quickly is what makes us more um, intuitive, is what makes us more dynamic. They have good tempo and good urgency. We believe in rhythm. We believe in cadence. I think there's something to that. Um, they have patience and they understand failure. Doesn't mean we like it. Doesn't mean we deal with it a whole lot, but probably because we respect it on a very high level. And they have a relentless effort. So that's the people. That's the plan. That's the uh, the performance. And the third part, the persistence in the plan was this. And this is something that this is the actual slide that I put up in the interview, however many years ago, and really simple cross-referenced, now it's changed quite a bit, but cross-referenced down this side by attitude and staff and scheming and community and off-season and year one, year two, year three, year four, a very clear four-year plan of what we want our program to grow in, in that facet every single year. And then once we do that, we'll move on to the next one, understanding it won't come. And it went well early on, um, we went from, we took over two and eight program. First year we went seven and three, we went 11 and two, went to the playoffs. Third year, 12 and one, quarterfinals, and then 13 and one. It worked, the plan worked out really well. We had gone from 206 in the country to number four in the country. <laughs> and, and then a, a big part of who we are now really came into focus because What's not on here, Doug, there's no fifth year plan. Like when you're standing on the precipice of a new coaching turnaround, four years is like forever, right? Four years. I mean, who stays at a place for 13 years, right? So I didn't even think about a fifth year. And that's where the program really went from where we had to build to where we had to not just sustain, but grow from there and find different ways to do it because the ROI was so much, the margins were so much slimmer than they were when you go plus five on a victory from this year to that year, plus six, and you go and you play for a national championship or whatever it might be. So we had to take pride in whatever returns we could find in those margins. And this is why it was really important. And this is, this is something we call the golden circle. If you look at just about any culture, call it what you want, family, a team, a business, an empire, any culture, whether it's the Roman Empire, whether it's the Ming Dynasty, whether it's a football team, whether it's a family, any culture that rises and falls always does so along this same circle. Fascinating to me, absolutely fascinating. So you start, I wish I could point, but I use the pointer. Excuse me. You start down here. And when you get to a point where the very first step is faith, nothing occurs. And then it goes on to liberty, freedoms, however you want to say it. Then it goes to having courage or belief. And then you have abundance. But right here, if we're not careful, that abundance always leads into complacency, which turns into apathy and then dependence and then bondage. So if you really take a beat and think about a culture that you have witnessed, whether it was 6,000 years ago or whether it was six days ago, rise and fall, these same common things come up. So for us, we were in a place, this was, I look back, I know the mountain was huge when we took the job over, I get it, and it was huge, and maybe my ignorance was bliss, to be frank with you, but I look at we, can you see that pointer, that arrow? Okay. Yep. So we went from, you know, get, having all these things to abundance, but here's where you want to be and you want to stay because what you can have happen is if you're not careful, that then goes into 
the downward slope that it's very difficult, if not impossible, I don't know, to recover from. So for us, we had to have such a strong belief in a very small number of things that we can replicate. I didn't feel like going all the way back through these things, frankly, with our program before we got to, to build it. And I know that people that all they try and do is stand right here at the pinnacle of that circle um, are not growing. So what we had to do was find a virtuous cycle where every year we had enough belief to go right from there, right back down. And yeah, of course, we're going to keep the same core principles. We're going to keep our experiences. We're going to keep the people in our lives, obviously. But to try and just hold on to something and not reteach or regrow to us just seemed a little bit either ignorant or arrogant, both of which are equally inexcusable. So that's where the program of sustainability, it act actually goes back to going back to square one so that we, we can hopefully bypass those things that we don't want to be a part of. And that was really important to our sustainability. Um, it got into where for us, the idea of pride and passion, which is our mantra, um, at that point, then we started being able to zoom out, and I can't get into all of them, but basic family legacy as what is is what we've been working on for the better part of the last five or six years. It's that very idea that all we are is what we believe in. These are acronyms. I'm not going to go too far into them, but what we believe, who we choose to love, and what we leave behind. The same as the second slide that I showed up there. And that's, that's how we continue that cycle, working on those, those three key things. Uh, and this is why, and I'll wrap it up. I'll let you ask any questions you want, but um, this is why, is because I gotta be the same guy. And I don't know if everyone does, I just know, I, I don't, spend my time worrying about everyone else as much as trying to figure out what I need to do. I need to be the same exact dude that I am with my family as I am with my football team. I got to be the same guy within the family, whether times are great or whether times are difficult. And I got to be that same person, whether it's fourth and one or whether it's possession in 10 or whether times are are, are easy and simple or not, or whether I'm recruiting you. I just simply, I'm not smart enough, nor do I have enough time to be two different dudes. I, I just don't. So the ability for us here over the years to cultivate the chance to bring these passions together are huge. I got to be the same exact, that's Rachel, that's when she had her hair painted darker, now it's blonde, but um, this one right here is Truman. Uh, they come to practice on Halloween, they, Halloween practice and Thursday practice up before Halloween, it's fun, they get candy out. This is Caden, this is Anna. You gotta be the same dude I am to them, like literally the same guy, and I don't use the word liter literally lightly, that I am to our players. This is them today, we've grown a little bit, Caruso's don't actually grow really tall, but, but they've matured quite a bit. But I need to be the same guy, just like our players do. When I ask you to go and come with me and read to my daughter's first grade class, I need you to be the same exact guy there that I recruited. And when you just uh, ran the ball down the throat of your opponent for 400 yards in front of 35,000 fans, I need you to be the same guy there. And honestly, when situations arise, when I get a call the day after the 4th of July and a senior D lineman says to me, coach, I got some bad news. I got cancer. Would you be in my first infusion? Heck yeah, I'll be at your first infusion. I told you I'll be in your life forever until I die. I'll be there. There's no doubt. And then things hit home, right? And a lot of people who are probably listening know that our family's trials and tribulations, that's, what, that's Rachel. Uh, then someday you're going to be at a conference meeting getting ready for the playoffs. This was two years ago in our family. And your wife's going to go in for a routine checkup, uh, 40 years old, as healthy as can be, 
eats well, exercises six days a week, and she's going to call you up and say, I got bad news. I got stage three colorectal cancer. Like, it's going to hit. So we better be able to be the same person no matter what. Now, here's the thing, Doug. You might have to unmute here. Since you're the only guy, I'm going to ask you, what is on that player's face right there? Huge smile. Big smile. What's on that player's face right there? Huge smile. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the simple one, right? In that situation, that's the fun one. Anyone can do that. What's on that? This guy is getting drugs pumped into his body at 21 years old to kill kids. What's on his face in his first infusion? Huge smile. And what's on her face? Smile. Smile. It's so simple. If we just approach things knowing that we're going to have to face times like we're literally in right now, like if we are listening to this live, that we're expect it, welcome it. And when you do so, do it positively. Because 90% of life is what we do with the 10% that's given to us. Let's at least respect and honor that, however you believe it's to be given to us. And this is what really allowed us to come up with what we need. And I think the needs versus wants are a really big deal. For us, there's honestly only three things that, that I care about, for me personally. Okay? I care about our faith. I care about our family. I care about our football. I don't. If I am not going to spend a minute of my time doing anything, if it does not go into one of those three buckets, either directly or indirectly, right? But where I got a little confused was even after I, and if I was more mentally tough, if I was a stronger person, I would probably be able to come up with, with less because I think less is actually more. You can tell the wealth of a man by what he can do without. But I got it down to three and I was pretty proud. But when I did, I thought that those were things that, that I had to juggle, for lack of a better term. But when you're juggling something, you're holding on to one, that means the other one's in the air and it's not being tended to. What I've come to realize where I am now, and this was pretty cool. This was actually put together by our starting linebacker in his engineering 171 freshman plastics class. This was awesome. I thought he, did, he, he described it better than me. He said, you know what? I think you do pretty well. He said, most people juggle things. He said, you've taken what you care about. This is him, his words, not mine. And you found a way over time to combine them into the same experiences. Now they don't completely overlap and his project was to actually print out a 3D printing of the space that is this triangle type thing. That's the space that's created when three circles come together, a rouleau. Um, but what I found is that going back to that third slide, what brings you joy? What brings me joy are when all of our needs or all of our passions can come together. Whether that's on Saturday afternoon at one o'clock in the fall, whether that's on a team trip to Italy with our family, whether that's while we're shacked up here with the coronavirus things going on. As long as we can keep those three things consistent and together, that's truly what brings me joy. So I get it. The kids come in and they recruit, and this is what they're thinking about. They're thinking about that. They're thinking about doing I, I am too. Like the, the most fun thing in the world for me, the, my favorite thing in football to do is to hit the opposing team's quarterback. My favorite thing to do. Okay. That's only the medium or the output of what we do. This is what they're thinking about when they start recruiting. I got a, a DM the other day from a guy who told me that he's gonna be my top 2024 quarterback. What, what, what? like it's crazy, that, that, but that's what attracts people, right? Is the football. But if they're not thinking about this, then we got it twisted. Our seniors, I will tell you right now, our seniors, when they are in their last year, on the second Thursday of October, will stand on the steps at Aquinas Hall in their dark suits, and they will take their senior picture. If they are the same people, when they take that picture, it's going to be at 1150. I'll tell you exactly when it's going to be. When they take that picture, if they're the same dude that they are today, like, shame on them. Shame on us if they haven't grown in every direction. And that really is how we keep the focus 
on, to me, what's important in the program. And the fact that we have had our fair share of success is just the output of that. So um, for anyone that's out there, there's my contact information. Uh, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. If you want to get a hold of me more directly, uh, then you know what? You can figure out a way if it means that much to you. You, you sharp people, you figure out. I'm not going to over digest things for you. But I do think that if I can leave you with one thing, this is, this is to me what is, <clears throat> I get up every day. This is what I think about, man. And this quote hung on our refrigerator growing up, and it now hangs on ours and in my office. And it's prepare the child for the path and not the path for the child. There are so many people that are out there, and you see them, coaches. Don't lie to yourself. You see them. That are trying to create some sort of path for a person. It's not how it works, man, because there's eight and a half billion of us. Please help in thinking about what we need to do to prepare our children for the path that they're going to face. And what a better time. What a better, there's no better time to demonstrate it than what we're in right now. So make the most of it. Doug, what do you want to talk about? Hey, man, I, I want to pick your brain a little bit, Coach. Uh, you know, some more culture and, uh, you know, staff-wise stuff. Because, I mean, no sure. one built it no one builds a culture by themselves. So, right. uh, it, you know what? And I asked Randy Jackson this down in Texas a few years ago, what percentage, uh, would you attribute your success between team culture or culture and your scheme? Is it a 70, 30 mix? Is it a 90, 10 mix? What, 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 what kind of, how would you quantify that? Um, excuse me. Got a call. Um, I, I would say this. I, I don't know how to quantify that. <clears throat> Obviously, like anything else, the truth is going to lie between the two extremes. I will say this. When I got into this in 1997, I believed in my heart of hearts that there were three reasons why anyone would have success in football, uh, in sport, but football. It would be... <clears throat> because of people, it would be because, be because of scheme and because of belief in that, okay? And when I was 22 years old, I prioritized them like this. I said, I think the most important thing is scheme. The second most important thing is, is personnel. The third most important thing is belief. However you wanna slide those and put them into a percentage of 100, do it. But that's what I believed really firmly. Then, about six, seven years went by, and uh, we were at NDSU at the time, and I started, uh, you know, recruiting and seeing what those guys recruiting a couple years down the road would look like when they were seniors and fifth-year players. And I said, oh, man, I'm, I'm 27, 28, something like that. And I'm like, I got it. I had it all wrong when I was 22. I thought it was scheme and players and belief. Now I got it. Now I know what it is. It's players. And then it's scheme. And then it's belief. And then I got my first head coaching job and cut my teeth and did all that kind of stuff. And about 15 years ago, I've come to what I believe, order them in what I, I, I believe today. And this hasn't changed. And, and I think the number one reason why people play well and win games is because of belief. I really don't think it matters whether you're running a wing tee or a 10 personnel spread RPO system and what your blitz patterns are, what your post lockups are. Um, I think belief in what you do is most important. And then I think it's personnel. And then I think it's scheme. So a little bit of a, a work around to your direct question, but that's how I came to that realization. And I, I think, I think I'll go to my grave in that order. I don't think I'm going to change them. Do you talk about uh, within your program, are, are you a goals type person or more of a process type person? Process. Process. For sure. Yep. And I'm not saying we don't have goals. We do. <clears throat> but I think that there have been, I was bigger on goals 15 years ago. And here's why. Because I think as our society has changed, and a lot of it has been for the better, let's not think that it's all negatively changed. I think that what society has done is provided opportunities for too many intermediary goals. So you have, uh, you know, check this and check this and check this and okay, I did, I did what I should. And 
here's my grade and I should start now. And so we always bet against the market, what we do. So because I think that that one is overplayed the goals a little too much in what, what is brought to us in an 18 year old young man, <clears throat> it allows us to work more on the process. And here's a, I know a lot of process coaches love it because it's so simple. You just have to be in the moment. And I am 100% with you. But I think one of, the, one of the benefits of it is when you focus on that very process, you build the mental toughness that it's going to take when your job is to get up every day and get out of bed and do the same thing over and over. Because mental toughness is not doing the superlative. No one wants to, you know, we got two, two boys that are teenage boys. They come home and they talk about the biggest or the fastest or the quickest. Or, it's all superlative. That's, you flip on ESPN, top 10 plays. Being mentally tough is doing the routine thing routinely. And when that can be built into your process as part of the process, I think you're building that too. Hey, I'm going to steal this one from, uh, from Zach. Zach had a, a good interview with Will Healy. Uh, he published this morning. Yeah. He asked Will what he does to self-scout himself as a head coach. Is there, what, what are some thoughts that go through your head at the end of a season or throughout the season where, where you're trying to evaluate your own performance, just like you evaluate coaches or players? I ask other people that have no emotional attachment to do it. So that's not to say that, I mean, I am, I would say I'm, I'm difficult on myself to a fault where it's, it might even be a little costly and I have to learn to be better. And that is mental weakness. And I have to learn a balance there. But um, <clears throat> I usually have um, a few dozen, maybe 20, 25 guys that um, we know each other well enough in the profession over a long period of time where trust is built over little data points over a long period of time where I can have them critique me. Um, and sometimes we do it. I mean, scenarios are all different, right? Uh, maybe a coach is out of coaching and he can sp come and spend time with us in our staff meetings and in our team meetings. Maybe a coach can do it by a film. Uh, maybe a coach can do it as we sit and we do our little, our little cracker barrel guys don't remember the old crackle cracker barrel series. It was like the very first small little clinics we used to do 20 years ago. And, and, uh, and just, uh, getting a little think tank, but, but be brutally honest because, uh, and we've had people in these groups that want, say they want the critique, but then when you're honest with them, they don't want to hear it and they're no longer in the groups. So just finding people who you trust. And I'll say this, our staff does an amazing job of keeping each other in check, as does Rachel, my wife, and our kids. And you might say, well, what is your wife? Look, I'm not asking my wife to evaluate the slant slant with the backside RPO on, it, on the backside of the outside zone. I'm not asking that. But, but in terms of how we're doing things, very important. And it all comes from this premise. We didn't get into it because I don't, we don't have time here. But when I ask most 17-year-old kids in recruiting or 18 what the opposite of love is, what do you think most kids say the opposite of love is? Hey. Correct. That's what they say. You're wrong. All, all wrong. It's, it's, it's incorrect. But you're right. Most people would say the opposite of love is hate. That's incorrect. The opposite of love is indifference or apathy or however you want to think about it and take it, take it from me, take it from our, our nation's best leaders, take it from the Bible, take it from the greatest world history leaders. If you love something, you're going to hold it accountable. Now, I understand that's going to cause angst, but when you, eh, yeah, sure, fine, whatever, those are attitudes that are going to take your culture in the tank. And if you can honestly find people that love you enough, I have a staff that loves me enough to say, hey, coach, I understand what you're saying, but I think you might want to sleep on this one. They love me enough to call me out. I have a wife who loves me enough to say, yeah, maybe you're not quite where you think you should be in terms of this or that. And you surround yourselves with those people. That's how I do it. I think that's a great 
how do you how do you do it, Doug? What do you utilize? If you don't mind me asking you, what what do I utilize for what specifically? For keeping yourself in check for self scouting yourself. I I honestly don't think I do a great job of that. Uh, you know, I I think I have a great resource with with football scoop and the connections that it's it's allowed me to have. Uh, pro probably a lot of the same ways that you do, just bouncing different ideas off guys. But I I don't do a good enough job uh doing that so you know it's part of the reason i asked the question is i i, I want to know what other guys are doing i had never really thought of that question until this morning like how am i self i can self-scout my program how am i self-scouting myself I, I hadn't thought about that till this morning well and that's a great question by zach zach also does an unbelievable job you guys and scott i don't know but i think if you when we think self-scout i think when you ask the question just like any other football coach, the first thing that comes to my mind is a binder that you get on Monday with all your tendencies, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason why that binder is so important to us is because there is no emotional attachment. If you ran Ralph Red or you ran uh, 142 wide post this many times out of this formation, or blitz this many times out of this front, then that's what it is. But when we can, so you have to be honest with yourself. When we can really be honest with ourselves and find a couple people that are willing to, and you, you are eminently qualified because you got more followers than just about anybody I know, more people that, that uh, you connect with. It's amazing. Um, so I think when we have people involved, just as long as you can be honest, it really gives a depth and content. Yeah, but I, I think that's a great spot to end it, Coach Caruso. Uh, no I, I really appreciate you hopping on, man. I know I learned a ton. This is going to be some great stuff for, for coaches everywhere. So I appreciate you taking the time, man. I appreciate you. And, again, i just a huge fan of the scoop, not because I I, I read all the, the, the posts all the time, but because it is a necessary resource for us as an organization, as a profession of football coaches, and for, for Scott and you guys to take on that tall task and then to spend your time in a worthy cause on it is something that we should all be grateful for. So thank you coaches out there. If you want to hit me up, like I said, you'll figure it out. The internet's a big place, but it's not tough to find. And uh, I hope that going through all this allows us uh, maybe a little bit better vision as to uh, what's really important in our lives. Thanks a lot, Coach Carissa. Take care.